You are listening to the Hero's Journey Podcast. I'm Jeff Garvin. And I'm Dan Zarzana. Let the journey begin. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Hero's Journey Podcast, where we discuss your favorite stories through the lens of Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey framework, as presented in his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and Christopher Vogler's modern cinema-focused adaptation, as presented in his book, The Writer's Journey. The month of March is Women's History Month, a period of the year dedicated to remembering and honoring the contributions of women throughout history and the ladies in our lives. For this month's poll, we selected three films featuring powerful female leads and asked our Patreon contributors to vote on which one they wanted us to discuss. I thought the results were, uh, sometimes there's like an overwhelming winner, and this was, I thought this was a good mix of of, uh, votes here. It was not a terribly tight race. Um, In third place, with 25% of the vote, is Mad Max Fury Road, starring Charlize Theron. Second place, with 30% of the vote, went to Hunger Games, a film that cemented Jennifer Lawrence as an international star. And the winner, with 45% of the vote, is The Silence of the Lambs, a thriller about a young female FBI cadet who rises to the occasion to help capture a violent serial killer before graduation day. (laughs) The final exam. Yeah, she aced aced the final. So 45% of the vote, that is less than a majority. That is a plurality, but not a majority. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. It's been a while, I think, since we've had this kind of result. Yeah, I was torn. I I would really have enjoyed doing all three of those of the films. So it was a win, 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 win. Based on Thomas Harris's novel of the same name, The Silence of the Lambs was released in theaters on freaking Valentine's (laughs) Day of 1991, (laughs) which might explain why listener Brad said it's his go-to movie date. Produced on a $19 million budget, the film went on to earn more than $273 million worldwide and spent five weeks at the top of the U.S. box office. Ooh, it was a dark time for people. Romance, desire, <laughs> the silence of the lambs. <laughs> the film then went on to be nominated for seven Academy Awards, five of which it won Best Adapted Screenplay for Ted Talley, Best Actress for Jodie Foster, Gina Davis and Susan Sarandon were also nominated for Thelma and Louise in the same category that year, which I mentioned just because we covered that movie in February of 2022 as part of our February rom-com series. (laughs) Anthony Hopkins took home Best Actor. Best Director was won by Jonathan Demme. Ridley Scott was also nominated for Thelma and Louise. And the picture took home Best Picture of the Year. In addition to Jodie Foster and Sir Anthony Hopkins, the film stars Scott Glenn as Jack Crawford, Ted Levine as Jamie Buffalo Bill Gum, Anthony Heald as Dr. Frederick Chilton. He's delightfully hateable in this movie. (laughs) And and there are several others that we will mention when we reach their scenes. All right, that's enough briefing. Study your case file. Steam up a pot of fava beans. And put the lotion in the basket. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god <laughs> this is the hero's journey of the silence of the lambs what was that first one study your case file dr Lecter. that was that's clearly <laughs> oh, that was your jody foster <laughs> I thought, look, I thought you were like not quite warmed up with a Sean Connery, <laughs> and I was wondering a, why he was only in the had movie. a month to prepare. <laughs> Study your case file. Study your okay. case file, Doctor. <laughs> Act one of the hero's journey begins with the world of common day. This is where we see our main character and their status quo normal life. Clarice Starling is a young FBI Academy cadet. She is exercising in the obstacle course in the woods outside Quantico, Virginia. An instructor tracks her down and informs her that Crawford, we don't know who that is yet, has summoned her to his office. Obviously, he's somebody of importance. So she returns to the training facility, heads to the office of Jack Crawford. This is played by Scott Glenn, whose greatest performance is in Silverado, I might add in the Behavioral Science Services Unit. 
As Clarice waits for Jack to arrive, she peruses the office wall, which is plastered with headlines and photos of murders committed by a serial killer known in the press as Buffalo Bill. Now, some notable elements of this sequence. Clarice is greeted warmly by multiple people as she passes through the training facility to Jack's office. So she appears to be well-liked among her peers, Hmm. which is a a subversion of my expectation. I thought she was going to be, oh, she's a woman, so everyone's going to be down on her. And she's going to get a lot of refusal from without from the other fellow cadets. Right. And she's welcomed by men and women equally. I thought that was important to note. Also, the black leather couch in Jack's office has a pillow and folded blanket stacked on the side, suggesting Jack sleeps in his office a lot. I did not notice that. Great detail. And Jodie Foster's five foot three height is highlighted when she gets into the elevator with the uh, gaggle of State Farm employees, all of whom (laughs) tower over her by half a foot or more. She's a tiny, tiny little person in this male dominated field. Jonathan Demme does a couple moments in the film where he emphasizes how small she is yes. in this world. I did notice that elevator shot. And uh, yeah, it's it. he really does a great job of silently showing you Clarice's place in this world of FBI. That was the end of the world of Common Day. That brings us to Call to Adventure. The heroes presented with a challenge which renders them unable to continue living in the comfort of the ordinary world. The ordinary world, the comfort here being just being a trainee, not yet in the terrifying world of actually doing the work of behavioral science. Right. There are no real world consequences to what she's doing yet. Exactly right. She's just a student. Oh, and I'm going to put a little tease here for the tidbits. The opening sequence of this movie, Jodie Foster had a big effect on how this movie opens. It was going to open completely differently. And she Mm -hmm. called up the director and said, hey, I want to do this instead. And it worked. You mean she called up the director? That's right. (laughs) Director Demi, I've got an idea. (laughs) Oh, that was almost George W. I'm (laughs) slipping into a little George, little Georgie boy there. (laughs) Oh, it's early. So and the time just changed. So our our impression engines are not fully. Oh, my God. Did that mess with you? My alarm went off. And I got up. I was like, oh, why is my alarm going off already? I stumble into the kitchen to get coffee, and the stove says it's 7 a.m. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, but I set my alarm for 8. Why is why, why am I up? And I looked at my phone, and yeah, my phone said it was 8. And I looked at – for about 12 seconds, I was so disoriented and confused. <laughs> no, my, my experience was – And then I went, was, oh, spring forward. Doggone it. I knew it was going to happen. I was ready. <laughs> I woke up. I got downstairs. I'm doing my thing. I'm taking care of the dogs. And then I look at the clock and I go, oh, I got tons of time. I looked at the clock on the stove because, you know, all of our (laughs) clocks set themselves except for the stove. Anyway, there's Clarice in the office. And like you said, she's looking over this bulletin board. Enter Jack Crawford. He lingers in the doorway. And I got the impression that he let her arrive first so that she could look around the office and see the Buffalo Bill stuff. I think he's testing her here to see if she picks up on it. Yeah, when she's going through the office and she she pops into another office before she goes to him and there's two gentlemen there and he's like, you're looking for Crawford? Just go wait in his office. He'll be back in a minute. Right. Crawford was on his hands and knees under that guy's desk <laughs> waiting for her to leave. And then, and then he came out. That scene was cut because it was deemed too silly. But So anyway, so Jack Crawford comes in. He greets her warmly. Starlight. Clarice in. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Crawford. Sorry to pull you off the course at such short notice. Your instructors tell me you're doing well. Top quarter of your class. I hope so. They haven't posted any grades yet. Then he, he sort of gives her bona fides in an exposition-y kind of thing, but he's telling her what he knows about her. And then he says, you were in my seminar at UVA. So we, they have this relationship already. He jokes about how she grilled him during the seminar about civil rights and but I gave you an A and she said A minus and they have this great so already they have great rapport they have a great relationship we know that Clarice is smart and that Jack already likes her he says he's got a job for her we're interviewing all the serial killers now in custody for a psychobehavioral profile could be a real help in unsolved cases most of them have been happy to talk to us you spook easily Starling not yet sir See, the one we want most refuses to cooperate. I want you to go after him again today in the asylum. She asks, who is it? And Crawford says, the psychiatrist, Hannibal Lecter. 
in the most blah, blah, just this dude way. Very frank. And it's a great reading by Scott Glenn because upon watching it, I've seen this film. This is one of those films where I've watched it a hundred times probably. You can see in his line reading that there is so much more behind that and that he's holding it back, but he's also kind of, you get the feeling that he's wondering what Clarice will see. He's really setting her up. He's testing her here. Mm -hmm. So he says like, it's a, you know, it's Hannibal Lecter, a psychiatrist. And then she <laughs> is says- that your Scott Glenn impression? <laughs> yeah. Scott Glenn as he appeared on The Simpsons. Her, her. And she says, uh, sotto voce, Hannibal the cannibal. So we already know that this is going to be a creepy guy we're meeting. So he wants her to go talk to him. Her report is due 8 a.m. on Wednesday. That's the call to adventure. The department, as you said, is interviewing serial killers in custody for this profile. That is work that was originally performed in real life by Agent John Douglas, Agent Robert Ressler, and mm. Dr. Ann Burgess in 1976 when th they were building the behavioral science unit of the FBI. That's right. You are a you and Michelle are like serial killer documentary nuts. My wife is definitely yes. Michelle yeah. is in fact she owns all of John Douglas's books, has read all of them, including the Crime Classification Manual. This is the book that Douglas, Ressler, and Burgess wrote. Wow. It's a textbook basically for the FBI on how to classify these crimes. Wow. And my sociopathic wife read this cover to cover. <laughs> Next segment is the refusal of the call. The hero is confronted with fear of the unknown. The call is refused either directly by the hero. Sometimes external forces work to push the hero backward. I almost put Clarice's reaction to the name Hannibal Lecter as a refusal, but the more I watched it, she doesn't even flinch. No, she's like, it's almost like she's like, yeah, I get to interview Hannibal the Cannibal. Yeah, there's some wonder when she says Hannibal the Cannibal. Yeah. So I changed my tact on, on this. Ooh. She goes to the asylum in Baltimore. <laughs> and right away, the director of the asylum, Dr. Chilton, played by Anthony Heald, wonderfully, I thought. This guy is greasy. Oh, my God. So greasy with a Z, greasy. And he immediately starts talking about how young and attractive Clarice is. Will you be in Baltimore overnight? Because this can be quite a fun town if you have the right guide. She's escorted down into the cells where these high-profile serial killers are being kept. Dr. Chilton and then Barney, the guard downstairs in this high-security area, give Clarice this series of instructions. Do not touch the glass. Do not approach the glass. You pass in nothing but soft paper. No pencils or pens. No staples or paper clips in his paper. Use the sliding food carrier. No exceptions. If he attempts to pass you anything, do not accept it. Do you understand me? Yes, I understand, sir. You're way ahead of me. You're super way ahead of me. Oh, wow. All right. I think we're in sync in that the refusal mostly comes from without, with people underestimating Clarice, pushing back on her because she's just a trainee or that she's a woman. There's a lot of that energy. I only had one refusal from within moment, and it's very subtle, but I love the way Jodie Foster played it. It wasn't a refusal moment, but she has a very, very small moment where he says, I gave you an A, and she says, A minus. And you get the sense she's very hard on herself. There's an element in her performance that she's teasing Crawford, but I also get that's the only moment where we see any flicker of self-doubt from Clarice. She is believes she is capable. That's almost her I can't be a wizard moment. <laughs> oh, interesting. I didn't see it that way at all, but okay. So you're already into my meeting with the mentor, which I'll now transition to. Meeting with the mentor. The hero receives counsel on how to operate in the special world. We also have supernatural aid, which is the unexpected assistance that comes to one who has undertaken their proper adventure, sometimes in the form of a sword or a weapon. Crawford is obviously a mentor in this story, and after his call, he gives her a dossier on Lecter, and he gives her a special FBI badge. This isn't a real FBI badge. It's a temporary FBI badge that expires in a few days, but it grants her special powers to get in to see Hannibal Lecter and qualifies her 
to do work on behalf of the FBI. So it is a special weapon. And then Chilton, as you described, is just a slimy, creepy guy. But both he and Barney lay out for her the rules of the special world. Hannibal Lecter is a monster. He's a psychopath. He hasn't seen a woman in eight years. You are his taste. And here are the rules of dealing with Hannibal Lecter, who is, in a lot of ways, her mentor in the story. Yes. Perhaps the most poignant bit of mentorship is as they're approaching this gate where she's going to enter the special world. Chilton shows her a picture. He says, this is what he did. You know, he 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 had a medical situation, had to go to the to the nurse. Here's what he did to the nurse. And we don't see the picture. All we right. see is Clarice's reaction to the horror of this is what he, you know, they were able to save one of her eyes. Ugh. So he ate this nurse's <laughs> face. And it's it's, a, it's one of those great don't show the shark moments. Yeah. It, and it reminded me of a lot of Fincher's tricks in Seven, where yes. people swear they saw the head in the box, but you never see the head in the box. People yeah. swear that they saw the horror of the lust yeah. murder. And you never saw that. You you saw the apparatus, but you didn't see the rest of it. But people swear that they saw it because yeah. the the horror of what people imagined in that moment was so much worse than what a special effects crew maybe could have come up with. And it's the same thing in, in this scene here. Like Jodie Foster's performance, it's Leland Orser's performance and Morgan Freeman's performance that creates the horror for us because we see how they're seeing it. Okay. So yeah. because you're past me, I think I'm going to take on the next segment if that's okay. Yeah. Crossing the threshold. The hero must pass a special barrier to enter the special world. Oh, my God. There's no greater threshold than in this movie. So they get to the end of this staircase. They have to go through a locked gate and then through another locked gate into the office and then into a man trap. So when they get into this first downstairs area, all the lighting is red. This is the descent into hell. So then she goes into a man trap and then she has to go through another. So she has to go through literally cross four thresholds to yeah. get into this special world of <laughs> behavior, of, of the, the real deal of working with serial killers. So I saw that, even though it's very early in the screenplay and in the running time, because we have a lot of movie ahead of us, mm -hmm. I saw that as the crossing of the threshold. He's past the others. The last cell you keep to the right. I put out a chair for you. Oh, yes, that's very good, thank you. I'll be watching. You'll do fine. That concludes Act One. Oh boy. Already. Well, let's uh, head to the Campbell Cafe for some side quests. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Campbell Cafe, where Jeff and I take a break from the current journey and we conduct some side quests. And Jeff, a quick note, our coffees here at the Campbell Cafe are paid for by our brand new patron, Matt Gallagher. Matt, thank you so much for joining us here at the Hero's Journey podcast. It really means a lot to Jeff and I that people like you think enough of the show to contribute and we really hope you enjoy the show. Thank you again so much for your participation. I have been watching a show on Apple TV Plus called Masters of the Air. Oh, with the Austin Butler? Yes, Austin Butler, Callum Turner. They play pilots of B-17 bombers in World War II. Ooh. I love the movie Memphis Bell. I have tried to put that on the poll multiple times, I read the memoir written by the pilot of the, the real Memphis Bell, and I just developed this fascination with that aspect of the conflict and the conflict, the war. I live near an airport, and for the longest time, there was a B-17 that was parked at the airport here. And it would take off sometimes, especially during like Memorial Day, Veterans Day, when they would do air shows in the area. And it would it would take off in there like right over my house, uh, apartment. And it was so cool. I love the sound of those four engines. I would run outside and watch it go overhead. Uh. Ah. 
I think it's such a gorgeous airplane, unfortunately built to kill and be killed in. This series is really scratching that itch for me, though, to learn more about it. What it's also doing a really good job of is expressing how awful an experience it had to have been for those men to be in these bombers. The Americans did daytime precision bombings. The British did nighttime bombings. So their success was much lower because you can't see at night, especially because at night the cities would black out. Everybody would turn their lights off. The city would mm. shut down the power to protect against bombings. Right. So the Americans started doing daytime precision bombing. Much greater success in terms of hitting targets, but also it's daytime. Right. Risky. They suffered horrible losses. Hmm. This show is is about that. It's about the 100th, which was hit terribly hard. That's Masters of the Air. It's on Apple TV+. Plus. Oh, I should also add, it's produced by uh, Spielberg, Tom Hanks. They did Band of Brothers 10, 15 years ago, and then they did The Pacific, and now they're doing another. Saving Private Ryan was sort of the genesis of their World War II buddy ship, right? Correct. We've covered that film on this podcast, deep into the archives. We did do that. I have so many things I, I could share, but the thing I really want to share is Silence the Musical. <laughs> <laughs> In 2002, these two brothers, John and Al Kaplan, wrote and performed themselves a nine-song Silence of the Lambs musical. And they <laughs> instead of burning a million CDs to give it to their friends, they put it up online. And even though this was pre-Facebook, Pre MySpace, it went viral. People were emailing each other the the link, and it ended up on in Entertainment Weekly and Maxim. And oh, it, it, wow. Howard Stern talked about it. I don't remember how I found out about it. Someone emailed me. So in 2005, they expanded it to an actual musical. They put it up at the 2005 New York City Fringe Festival, and from there they mounted it in Broadway. It is hilarious and i'll post a link but then i wow. just found out as i was looking this up they also so they made a, a full-length musical called 24 season 2 the musical based on the tv show <laughs> but then they have a youtube channel called lego lambs l-e-g-o and then the word lambs they have done one-off musicals of a number of Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, so single-song musicals. They did Conan oh. the Barbarian the musical, Predator I'm the in. musical, T2 okay. the opera, Commando, <laughs> Total Recall. I can't believe I didn't know these. Wow. You have to do some deep dives on this. And then in 2010, they recorded and produced a short Lego video <laughs> during which Darth Vader helps John Williams compose the Imperial March. <laughs> <laughs> and in 2013, John Williams showed the video at his Hollywood Bowl L.A. Philharmonic concert. That's awesome. So it won a bunch of awards, uh, and you should go listen to it immediately. I can't even imagine what that's like. It's such not the type of subject for a comedy musical, but in the same way, it's exactly the right way to go with it. Because you don't want to just do Silence of the Lambs again. You want to put a new spin on it, and to make it a comedy musical is... Kind of a brilliant idea. The best song in the musical, in my opinion, is Buffalo Bill singing, Are You About a Size 14? <laughs> With that silliness left behind, let's move on to Act 2. But before we get into Act 2, a quick note. We are really excited to announce our very first interview. Actor Dan Butler, who plays the role of the entomologist Roden, here in Act 2 of The Silence of the Lambs, joined Jeff and I for an interview over Zoom. We talked to him for about 30 minutes. We've got a highlight interview that will be presented during the beverage break, and then the full 30-minute interview is available on our Patreon page for subscribers, ally tier, and above. So we hope you enjoy that interview, and we look forward to more. Act two of the hero's journey begins with tests, allies, enemies, a.k.a. the road of trials. The hero is now in the special world where they make allies, enemies, and must pass a series of tests to prove their worthiness. 
I have the first test as the meeting with Hannibal Lecter. Well, you got to talk about allies and enemies first. So, oh, that's I didn't even write those down. That's how. Oh, no. Why would, so obviously on the, <laughs> on the allies side, you've got Scott Glenn's character Crawford. Yeah. God, who else is an ally? Roden. Oh, the yes. Ent- the entomologist. Roden, the entomologist and his. Uh, Ardelia. His sidekick, the <laughs> relentlessly oh. hitting on. Dr. Dr. Pilcher. Dr. Pilcher. Uh-huh. Are you hitting on me, Dr. Pilcher? <laughs> Yes. Ardelia. Oh, so, you, so you did this right. Who else you got on the list? Ardelia, her fellow female cadet. I got the impression the they, FBI were, Academy. they were roommates, maybe. They might have been roommates. Sure. And I shape shifter, but kind of firmly in the ally categories. Hannibal Lecter. I want to put him in the ally for camp so hard. Clarice. Yeah. Certainly not for anybody else, but they build a mutual respect. Yeah. And he legitimately likes her. And wants to help her. Yeah. But he does a lot of testing of her to make sure that she's actually worthy of his assistance. Oh, boy, does he. So in that way, like you said, in the mentor section, he's probably the greatest mentor. Oh, for sure. Other than Jack Crawford. That's what makes this movie so compelling is the unlikely relationship between yeah. Hannibal Lecter and Clarice and the the way they help each other. Because she does help Hannibal Lecter in a way that Anthony Hopkins makes brilliantly apparent i love it enemies obviously buffalo bill yeah chilton oh yes the first test is this first meeting with hannibal lecter she's crossed the threshold into this dungeon i mean a dungeon is the best word for it it's a dimly lighted subterranean corridor with crumbling bricks on one side and and cells on the on the other the old kind with the iron bars i mean it's just it's a dungeon and Tension mounts. She's slowly walking down this corridor. And Jonathan Demi loves to use point of view shots. And in fact, many of the shots of characters other than Clarice, they're looking directly into the camera. This camera is Clarice's point of view. Right. And then when we see Clarice, her eye line is just slightly off camera. But so in this sequence, she's walking down the, uh, this dark corridor and we see her point of view. She's approaching this folding chair that is set six, seven feet off from the edge of the, so it is clear that this is a, a you are far away from this character for a reason. So <laughs> the tension mounts as she's, she's passing these other inmates and one's leering at her and the other one is just sort of sitting despondent in a chair. And then she passes the third cell and this scraggly, dirty, skinny man is leering at her and sort of following her along the bars as she goes. And yeah. he, he says to her, I can smell your cunt. Just the creepiest line you could possibly say. Yeah, that doesn't work at bars anymore. You can't, you can't pick up a lady at a bar with that line anymore. That's, you Hashtag gotta do me better. too. You got to do better. <laughs> so finally, she arrives at Lecter's cell, and it's not an iron bars. It is a clear plexiglass panel, two, three inches thick with air holes, and it's supported by these metal beams. And unlike the other inmates who've been either sort of like clinging to the bars or hiding in their bunks or sitting on a chair... Lecter is standing upright with his hands at his sides in the dead center of this cell. Good morning. And from the get-go, it's like he is her host and she is visiting his house. He is in control, even though he's the inmate in the cell and she's the FBI agent, he is in control from the beginning. So she gets to the cell. Throughout this scene, this is, it's a double test. Lecter's testing her and Clarice is being tested by Crawford. Crawford's testing her to see if she's skilled enough to develop a rapport with Lecter and draw information out of him. And he even used reverse psychology in that mentor scene, uh, in the call to adventure scene, by telling her he didn't expect Lecter to talk to her. I don't expect him to talk to you. Just do what you can, see if there are drawings. Which is a great, for Clarice is so ambitious, you can kind of see her taking that, oh, I'll get him to talk to me. Now, Lecter is testing Clarice. He's testing her to see, are you a worthy opponent? Can I get something from you? Are you just a pawn? Are you someone who could entertain me or feed my emotional vampirism? That's such an incredible scene. Hopkins is charming and creepy and flirtatious (laughs) and paternal. I mean, it's Uh, all over the map. He owns this scene. And at first, you know, he, he sees the date on her badge and says that expires Wednesday. He immediately identifies that she's a trainee and he's offended almost that Crawford would send him a trainee. And then he asks what Miggs said to her and she admits what he said. And his response 
is <laughs> I myself cannot. And then he turns his head up and sniffs the air and he says, you use Evian skin cream and sometimes you wear Le Deton, but not today. And he has this <laughs> smile and Clarice is just freaked out. This guy mm -hmm. can tell what perfume she wears. He has superhuman olfactory sensory ability. He is his superpower is he is the most perceptive yeah. person on the planet. His smell, his what he sees, what he can see in the dark, he knows everything about you the moment he sees you. And I I want to go through this scene line by line, but I I won't. The dialogue is flawless, the performances are stunning, and by the end of it, these two characters have formed the most unlikely mentor mentee team right. I've ever seen. The other thing is that I, when I'm watching this movie for the, I don't know, I don't know how many times I've watched this movie, I become aware of the the Beauty and the Beast trope in this movie played out in, in a very different way. The beautiful young woman who learns from the monster and tames him. I don't think I've ever seen a trope more beautifully twisted as it is in this movie. Tames him? Huh. She turns him into a mentor. If she, if she wasn't who she was... He would have just disregarded her. So obviously mm. he doesn't turn him into a prince, um, but that's part of the twistedness of that trope here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he starts. she starts to leave, and then she's walking down the hallway, and Miggs throws a wad of his sputum, of his <laughs> semen, at her, hits her right in the eye. Now, Dan, the first time I saw this, I'm sure I did not see it in the theater. I saw it on a TV. Watching this, on a 60 inch plasma flat screen that it hits her right in the eye and it is a giant glob. I mean, it's just disgusting on the deepest level. So all the inmates are now, they're all agitated and excited and, and Lecter screams, come back Clarice. And he says to her that he would not have had that happen to her because discourtesy is unspeakably ugly to him. He's mm -hmm. offended and now he wants to make up for the you know the rudeness of his of, of his fellow inmate <laughs> yeah and he gives her first clue he says i'll give you a chance for what you love most advancement look deep within yourself clarice go seek out miss moffat an old patient of mine m-o-f-e-t this test is a pass she got info out of lecter she earned her first clue mm -hmm. and she runs out of the building and after enduring a painful childhood flashback of greeting deputy dad as he comes home from work she has herself a good cry against the side of her rusty Ford Pinto. The next test comes in the form of a training sequence. My favorite stuff in any movie. She's on the firing range. <laughs> we never see her hit the target, so we don't know if she passes that, but we assume she's a good marksman. We have to wait until resurrection to see manifest her skills with a firearm. She's doing some kind of raid drill where she busts into a room with a gun and she doesn't check the corner, so she's dead. That's a fail. Uh, she's running with her classmate, getting quizzed on FBI codes, and the male runners gawk at her as she runs by. But she knows all the answers, so that's a pass. Now she's doing research. She's at a microfiche machine. Dan, do you remember microfiche machines? I certainly do. So for our millennial and younger listeners, before there was the internet, old records and newspapers were stored on these little microfilm spools, and you would put them into a machine, and it would shine a light through it onto a big screen, and you would have to twist these knobs to roll it forward and back. <laughs> While she's doing this research, a classmate tells her she's got a call from Crawford. This happens a lot in the movie. Someone has to come up to her and tell her she's got a call from Crawford. And it, it's and I'm watching this in 1991, so there weren't cell phones. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. all those actors that just had that one part where they go, Crawford's got a call for you. Those actors don't have jobs now because of cell phones. It would have The scene would have been irrelevant. <laughs> that guy maybe got his SAG card because cell phones didn't exist. Uh, cell phones ruined everything long before AI. Anyway, Crawford tells her Miggs is dead. Because Lecter whispered to him in the night and talked him into swallowing his own tongue as punishment for being rude to Clarice. This test is a pass because when Crawford asks her, hey, do you, is there, have you found anything about Miss Moffat? She has used her detective skills to figure out that there's a, a storage facility in Baltimore called Yourself. The next test, she goes to the storage facility. The door is stuck, but she won't be stopped. No one's going to help her because the driver doesn't want to do physical labor. So she gets the rusty jack from her pinto and jacks open the door. This woman is resourceful and she's mm -hmm. relentless. And for some reason, she had to go to this in the dark. <laughs> 
and there's apparently no lights in this storage facility, so she has a flashlight. There isn't one in mine. Really? There's well, no, don't go there at no night. no lights inside the storage don't facility. Don't go there at the unit night. itself. Stay during the day. <laughs> So this storage facility is like there's an eagle statue, an animal skull, and an old hearse that she whips off this massive American flag and opens the door of the old hearse. And they're in a floating in some kind of liquid. What's that stuff called? Formaldehyde, Formaldehyde. is a, a head and it's it's a head in a jar and it's got a patchy kind of beard, but lots of makeup and a, a fake eyelash that's kind of coming off. Yeah, uh, this is Hester Moffat. This is a pass. She has found the clue that Lecter sent her to go find. Next test is she goes back to Lecter. It's another amazing scene. She's soaked from being in the rain, and Lecter passes her a towel through that drive through pharmacy drawer. This is <laughs> an important moment because she's not supposed to accept anything from him, but she takes the towel, establishing trust. She's trusting him. She's deciphered that Hester Moffat is an anagram for the rest of me. And Lecter tells her that that head is belongs to a former patient of his called Benjamin Raspail, and that Lecter didn't kill him. He was an experiment, a fledgling killer's first effort at transformation. She presses him about Benjamin Raspail. What do you mean transformation, doctor? And he says, I'll help you catch Buffalo Bill if you'll help me get transferred to somewhere with a view. This is a pass. She has passed his test of are you worthy of me and can you help me? And now he's offering a deal. I will help you. If you give me this, the next test is for Buffalo Bill and boy, does he pass <laughs> <laughs> a young woman named Catherine Martin is driving down the highway in Memphis, listening to Tom Petty. We immediately like her because she's listening to American Girl. And when, when she gets to the chorus, she sings the backing vocal part that we all sing. <laughs> Make it all right. Make it last all night. So she's a real person. We like her. So she parks her Volvo at her apartment and she there's a handicapped guy trying to get a couch into the van, but we know it's Buffalo Bill because we've seen him looking at her through his crazy night vision goggles. And she does something stupid and gets in the back of the van and he pushes her into the van with the couch and asks her, are you about a size 14? And she says, <laughs> I'm sorry. And he hits her on the head and cuts up the back of her dress and throws it on the floor as he drives away. So Buffalo Bill gets a pass. Catherine Martin, not so much. <laughs> yeah. A couple more tests. I'm surprised you have not yet mentioned anything about the actor who plays Buffalo Bill. Oh. You and I have, have a very special thing about this guy. Why don't you tell us about Ted Levine, Dan? <laughs> bang, bang, bang. Most, yeah, he's like right. the most, like, so Ted Levine is, you, you might know him from the show Monk. He's like Monk's boss on Monk, but he's also in Dan's in my favorite movie, Heat. From 1995, he is the cop who, when, when I don't know why we why we locked in on this guy when Vincent Hanna shows scene. up at the first uh, at the the scene where they they break open the what do you call it the vault truck what do you call yeah, that the, the armored car thank you armored the, the car use, yeah he's he's describing what happened now this guy I figured this guy went for that holdout piece ankle holster right here bang 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 side and he bang bang to the side <laughs> you and i constantly go bang 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 side <laughs> i don't know but anyway that was ted levine and yeah. i i have not seen silence of the lambs in 20 years oh until really? we did this and so i didn't know that it was him oh my god yeah so then oh. i see i'm like oh and so i just start, i'm sitting there watching i'm going oh oh it's bang 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 <laughs> And then, of course, I had to stop the movie, go watch that scene in Heat, and then come back and finish the movie. So he's um, <laughs> he's one of those actors who disappears into a role, and he's I was going to say inimitable, but he's imitable. You can imitate him, and that's why he's so memorable. Yeah, like no everybody, one... everybody, right now, right now, go bang, 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 bang side. Bang. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> apparently, Seth Green designed his voice for Chris Griffin on the family guy based on Ted Levine. Oh, the son, the son. Oh the my son, God. The son, yes. I read that and I was like, man, I wanna get this job so bad. <laughs> and um, a friend had been staying with me and we were just joking about <laughs> Silence of the Lambs. I thought I've told this story like dozens of times, but we were joking about Silence of the Lambs because that actor Ted Levine who plays Buffalo Bill <laughs> is the creepiest character ever. And my friend and I were just kind of imagining him in every sort of job. 
you know, because his voice was so like, oh, yeah, we're she a great big fan, you know. <laughs> and so we just started putting him in every job, every drive through we went through. We're like, all right, you want a combo meal? <laughs> and it just, it just made us laugh all day. And when I went in there, I was like, man, what am I going to do for this? I don't want to be the like, what's up, dude? And then uh, I got ballsy in the audition, as apparently they did in the writer's room. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, can I try something really silly? And I did. And, and uh, McFarlane liked it. So I got the job. Yeah! <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> but it's, he's, it's kind of a whinier, higher pitched because he's a teenager. So. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so when Chris God. talks, it's more like this. But you can see how he might grow up to say bang, bang, bang. Oh, that's amazing. OK, so. <laughs> OK, that was a law. How much of that are we going to leave in? Anyway, go ahead. OK, next test. Clarice is at training again, trying to train. And yet again, she's interrupted by a summons from Crawford, like Crawford. She's supposed to be a mentor, but you keep interrupting her train. How's she going to graduate? And just cut her a break. So she gets into the chopper with Crawford, and they head to Clay County, West Virginia, to examine the body of another Buffalo Bill victim. And during this helicopter trip, uh, we learn it's, it's, it's an air, it's an airplane, but okay. oh, is it a plane? Wow. So she gets into the plane. That doesn't sound as cool. <laughs> <laughs> mm -mm. <laughs> so. We learn about Bill's pattern. So he, he captures his victims, he keeps them alive for three days, and then he shoots them and skins them and dumps them in a river in a different place each time. Then we cut to the car. So they've been in a plane, now they're in a car. I love how in a movie, if you have a long exposition scene, if you just change the location, have them walk and talk, have them get in a plane, have them get in a car, if you break it up like that, yep, makes it more interesting. That's what's going on here. Unpacking all this information that we want to hear in a way we want to hear it. So Starling is reading the murder file and Crawford asks her to profile the killer. And this is a great test. She says, white male, owns a house for privacy, 30s or 40s, strong, he's got self-control, he's cautious, he's precise, and he won't stop. And Crawford says, not bad. So that's a pass. Second to last test, the autopsy of the victim. They arrive at the funeral home. Crawford kind of runs a sexist snub routine on Clarice so that they can get the sheriff out of the way. You could tell it hurts her feelings. This is another moment where you see Clarice encircled by taller male law enforcement officers. Yes. She's the lamb surrounded by the wolves. <laughs> she has a, a flashback of being at her own dad's funeral. And then we cut to the autopsy beginning. So the room is packed with deputies and they're gabbing and drinking coffee. And Crawford's trying to talk on the phone and get a fax. And Starling takes control of the room very politely says, go on now, let us take care of her, and clears the room so that Crawford can finish his phone call. And then during the autopsy itself, Clarice is an incredibly observant and effective detective as she examines the body. She sees multiple ear piercings and glitter nail polish, so she's, she's from town. She's not from this rural area. Her fingernails are broken off. There's dirt underneath them as if she tried to claw her way out, which becomes important. So it's a pass. The autopsy is a pass for her. And then while examining the photos of the victim's mouth, she's the one who spots something stuck in her throat. It's the chrysalis or pupa. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't wait till we get to that scene. <laughs> it is my favorite scene. <laughs> it's like they give Hannibal Lecter this, this very expository line where he says chrysalis or pupa and then moves on with the rest of his line. And it's like people don't talk that way. Like no one, does, you know. And so when he delivers this parenthetical, he's giving his line, the chrysalis, and then he turns toward Clarice, or oh, pupa. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway. That is why he won Best Actor. It's pu or oh, pupa. It's it's the pupa, pupa. scene. That's it. Not, none of the rest of it. Not uh, liver beans, liver fava beans. Nope, it's the pupa. Anyway. When they turn the body over to get the prints, Clarice notices the diamond-shaped cuts in her back, and that becomes an important clue. So as the final test, Clarice takes the pupa to a museum to consult with two scientists and learns via the entomologist named Rodin. Agent Starling, meet Mr. Acherontius Styx. Weird. Better known to his friends as the Death's Head Moth. Now, where does it come from? God, that's what's strange. They only live in Asia. Asia? In this country, they'd have to be specially raised from imported eggs. Uh, somebody grew this guy. Fed him honey and nightshade. Kept him warm. Somebody loved him. That entomologist Rodin 
played by Dan Butler, who you may recognize from Frasier and from a million other amazing TV performances. So memorable in this role. The way he talks about this moth, the way he's excited about it. At the end of the scene, he says, this, this isn't just, you know, this, someone had to take care of him. Someone, someone loved him. And he's got this, this yeah. sparkle in his eye when he says that. It's just <laughs> such a deep performance. But we'll get to more of that later. So that's what I saw is the end of Tests. The next segment of the hero's journey is the approach to the inmost cave. The hero reaches the edge of a dangerous place where the object of their quest is hidden. After Rodin fawns over the Acherontia Styx, or Death's Head Moth, we then cut to Buffalo Bill's lair, where we see a bunch of live Death's Head Moths fluttering about. He has a motherarium. He... <laughs> Sure. We also see a naked Buffalo Bill sitting at a sewing machine, sewing something. Mm. And a little white dog. Is it a teacup poodle? Or I think it's a toy poodle. My parents had a toy black poodle. toy poodle. That teacup was about... poodle, definitely not, because it's much bigger than that. But toy poodle, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. it's definitely not a standard poodle, because standard <laughs> poodle are, those are big dogs. They're like size 14. Have you ever seen a standard poodle? They're huge. Yeah, you could ride them. This little white dog named Precious is looking down into a subterranean pit, and we hear a woman screaming for help. Clarice is back at the FBI Academy, and she and Ardelia, they see a news broadcast identifying the latest kidnapping victim, the one that we saw a couple scenes ago, identified as Catherine Martin, daughter of Senator Ruth Martin. Uh-oh, Buffalo Bill done kidnapped a government official's daughter. Oops. And Senator Martin addresses Buffalo Bill through the TV cameras. You have a wonderful chance to show the whole world that you can be merciful as well as strong. That you're big enough to treat Catherine better than the world has treated you. And she keeps referring to her daughter as Catherine, Catherine, Catherine. And you hear the murmurings of all the FBI cadets that are watching this TV. And they're talking about how that's really smart. If he keeps saying her name, it'll humanize her, might make it harder for Buffalo Bill to kill her and cut her up. Yeah. Clarice then visits Hannibal in the asylum again, who informs him that if his profile of Buffalo Bill helps capture Buffalo Bill in time to save Catherine Martin, then Senator Martin promises to transfer him to the VA hospital in Oneida Park, New York, with a view of the woods and the sky, plus one week a year he'll get to visit Plum Island, where he can walk on the beach and swim in the ocean. So she inserts the Buffalo Bill case file and Senator Martin's offer into the food exchange slot and sends it through to Hannibal. <laughs> and he looks at the map. Plum Island Animal Disease Research Center. Sounds charming. I love how when she pushes the drawer in, Hannibal leans forward and kind of peeks over into the drawer to look as though he's nervous she might have passed him something dangerous. <laughs> it's such a great little moment. All right. So Hannibal and Clarice, they engage in a quid pro quo of information now. Clarice reveals that after she was orphaned, after her father died... We didn't talk about this, but he died from gunshot wounds sustained when he was trying to capture two burglars or surprised two burglars mm -hmm. coming out of a store and they shot him. Yeah. She went to live with a mother's cousin on a sheep ranch in Montana, but ran away after two months. Not because, as Hannibal Lecter said, what did the rancher fondle you? Did he sodomize you? And she says, no, he was a very decent man, but she doesn't go into why she actually ran. Quid pro quo, now Hannibal tells Clarice... The Buffalo Bill may have applied for sex reassignment surgery at one or all of the three major hospitals in the country that performed that procedure and was probably rejected. So look at those three hospitals. When we first picked this movie, I got nervous because it features a cross-dressing serial killer. And I thought, man, are we, are we reinforcing the trope of transgender people being crazy dangerous and yeah. is that is that damaging but we watched it again and i realized okay he's not really transgender he thinks he is and also clarice interrupts lecter and says the literature shows no 
connection between transsexuals and violence. So she busts the stereotype in 1991, and I was like, that's good writing right there. Because she's not trying to make a statement. She's just debunking that myth right off the bat. She knows right. she's read the literature. Hannibal's guess is that Buffalo Bill suffered terrible abuse as a child, thus hates his own identity, and is trying to physically change. And that's what the moth is about. The moth represents transformation. So now we cut to Buffalo Bill and the famous lotion scene. Oh, man. One of the most quotable lines of this movie, we hear Buffalo Bill referring to Catherine as it. It rubs the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. Now remember, at the beginning of the segment, we heard the FBI cadets saying, if Buffalo Bill sees Catherine as a person, it'll make it harder for him to do what he wants to do to her. And by the way, Put the Effing Lotion in the Basket is the second best song in Silence the Musical. Again, <laughs> okay. I will link it. What I really enjoyed about this scene, aside from its amazing quotability, is that Catherine is pleading with Buffalo Bill. Please just let me I want. And she starts crying. I want to see my mommy. Please let me mm. out of here. And we see Buffalo Bill's lower lip begin to quiver. She's breaking his mm -hmm. barrier. Yeah. Then she sees the bloody handprints and the embedded fingernail in the wall of this subterranean pit that she's been put in and starts screaming. Ugh. And then he starts mimicking her screaming mocking her, rebuilding his barrier. Suddenly he's seeing this as an animal now and yeah. no longer is she a person. He also pinches the front of his t-shirt and pulls it away as though he's imitating having breasts. Bro yes. He is unhinged here. It is such yeah. a disturbing performance by Ted Levine. <laughs> it's, it's a fantastic performance. <laughs> Dr. Chilton tells Hannibal now that there is no deal with Senator Martin. He called her, and she knows nothing about it. You got scammed. Mm -hmm. However, Dr. Chilton has come up with a new plan with Senator Martin, and as long as Hannibal can identify Buffalo Bill's name, he will arrange for a transfer to a Tennessee prison, presumably with a view. Right. And so Hannibal says, the first name is Lewis. I'll tell the rest of the senator herself. There's one element of this last scene, though, that pays off later, but I just need to bring it up because I didn't understand how it happened. Hannibal, at this point in the film, has been strapped to a dolly and has a mask over his face, and Chilton has left his pen on Hannibal's cot. Oops. We'll leave it there because my question comes up later. So. Yeah. Clarice has been caught trying to trick Hannibal, and we have seen Buffalo Bill treating Catherine Martin, not as a person, but as an animal, and her murder is imminent. We are approaching the danger zone. As I mentioned, I've watched this movie many, 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 many times. This is the first time where I realized, I think, in retrospect, Hannibal knows that the offer Jodie Foster is making him is BS. The reason being... He's now, with her, more interested in her personal story. It's his emotional vampirism coming into play. He wants to draw that story out of her. So for him, now with Clarice, it's a quid pro quo. Because if he believed the deal were real, he would have said, it's Lewis, and I'll give you the rest when I see Senator Martin herself. He could have played that card with Clarice, but I think he knew it was BS. And there's a moment later where he can confronts Clarice about it, and it's really great. This brings us to ordeal. The hero faces the ultimate test, often risking death to overcome their worst fear, sometimes actually appearing to die. Crawford gets the call. The jig is up on his fake deal, and now the case is being handed over to the Department of Justice. Crawford's worst nightmare, the case is out of his hands. Yeah. You want to talk about who the, who the FBI director is? You tell. Played by Roger Corman, the famous B-movie director. Oh, that's the Roger Corman. It's the same Roger Corman? 
who also plays the senator in Apollo 13, who wants to scrap oh. the space program, who doesn't think people are interested in going to space anymore. So why why are we spending money on this? Wow, dude, I had not put those. That's amazing. There's another famous director featured later in this film as well. I look forward to hearing you expose that secret. <laughs> so Hannibal arrives in Memphis wearing this crazy lower half of the face hockey mask with like little metal bars across the mouth and he looks <laughs> absolutely insane this is the this is the yeah. image we have of Hannibal Lecter straight jacketed strapped to a refrigerator dolly with uh -huh. that crazy mask on he sees Senator Martin face to face and after getting under her skin and talking about did she breastfeed Catherine and like an amputated man's leg do her nipples now tickle her just to, again the cruelest thing he could say he's saying to her and then as they're wheeling him away she describes buffalo bill's physical description and then gives his full name lewis friend which of course is a lie but they don't know that at the time so now we have clarice's ordeal it's her final visit with hannibal lecter so she goes to the shelby county courthouse to visit him uh, he's being held in a cage on a dais in the middle of some kind of like ballroom or exhibit hall in the corner. <laughs> yeah. He's got portraits around the edges of it. And it's got like, it, it looks like a turn of the century speech hall or something. It's a very strange room. In this cage, he's got a bed and a desk and a like a rolly chair. He's even got a little privacy screen for when he has a to, rolly to chair. Go tinkle. Yeah. <laughs> and he's sitting with his back to Clarice reading a book of poetry and he's he's sitting regally, you know, holding this book yeah. up in his hand as if he almost is almost like he's posing for a painting. Yeah, he is the master of his world. Clarice approaches and he before he even sees her, he knows it's her because he's the master of perception and he he greets her and after giving her a hard time um and even some credit for coming up with he calls it Anthrax Island. <laughs> and you can see he's almost delighted that she came up with this. Like he's, he's, he says, that was good. That was very good. He's, he's amused by her cleverness. So they play the quid pro quo game again. Lecter is a twisted mentor. She's asking him questions. She is desperate to get Buffalo Bill's real name. She wants to know who he is and where. She's decoded that Lewis Friend is an anagram for iron sulfide, which is fool's gold. So she's the only one that's re that gets his clues. Everyone else is fooled by him. And he won't give her the answer. He says everything's in the case file. And he's teasing these emotional details out of her about why did she run away from that ranch. And she finally has to tell him the truth that she woke up one night and heard this horrible screaming. And she went downstairs and crept into the barn and saw the spring lambs being slaughtered. And she was horrified and she tried to set them free, but she opened the gate and they wouldn't leave. So she picked up one lamb and just ran away and tried to carry him away, but couldn't. And Lecter says, ah, so you think if you save Catherine Martin, you won't wake up in the night anymore hearing the screaming of the lambs. And she says, I don't know. And he closes his eyes as if he's just eaten the most delicious thing in the world and says, <laughs> thank you. He just got what he wanted. He finally got the most intimate, dark secret that Clarice had. He got it out of her. This is what he wanted. And in that performance, I don't know what Anthony Hopkins was thinking of, but there, Lecter really needed something there, and he, and he got it. Hannibal Lecter doesn't eat people because he's a psycho. He eats people because he wants to get their insides. He wants the most intimate thing. He, he's eating her emotionally. <laughs> he's drawing out of her this dark secret. Such a brilliant character. She gives him what he wants and he says, what's his name? And just as we think Hannibal might be about to answer, we hear footsteps and he says, Dr. Chilton, I presume. And Chilton shows up with his cops to end the interview. Clarice is not supposed to be there. He is one. He doesn't want her to have access anymore. This is his case. And so they're escorting her out of the building. And um, Lecter says, brave Clarice, you will let me know when the lamb stops screaming, won't you? And then he calls her back to give her the case file. So she breaks away from the cops and runs back to the cage and he hands her the case file through the bars. And as she takes it, he runs his finger along yep. her finger. It's such an interesting moment because I didn't get that there was anything lecherous about it. 
I think it was genuine affection there. And I think you can interpret it any way you want, but I just thought that was a really tender, creepy, wonderful moment between the two of them. <laughs> creepy, so, wonderful. <laughs> so, that, so, so that's where I that's where I drew the line of ordeal. Dr. Chilton, as you said, when he arrives to throw Clarice out, he's accompanied by two uniformed police officers and a man in a suit. And the man in the suit is director George Romero. Oh, dang. Night of the Living Dead? Night of the Living Dead. Okay, that so. That series of films. It's also about people who eat other people. Yeah. Uh-huh. 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 And I'm wondering if were Romero and Demi friends? Huh. Because he has no lines. He's just there. Was he visiting set that day? He's like, hey, I heard about this movie. And and Demi's like, hey, you want to put the suit on and be in my movie? I, I don't That's know. I, I, interesting to me when things like that happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That brings us to the reward. <laughs> Having faced their worst fear, the hero seizes the object of their quest. Clarice is now in possession, again, of the Buffalo Bill case file, which has now been read and... Annotated? Annotated is the word I was looking for by Hannibal Lecter. She sits with Ardelia and they talk about Lecter's notes. He, he has noted on the map that Crawford showed to Clarice earlier when mm -hmm. they were in the helicopter slash plane and <laughs> says, and, and the note says, don't these seem desperately random as though they're trying to be made to look random as they are not random at all. And they start talking it out. Clarice remembers, or actually I think it was Ardelia who says, what did Lecter say about coveting? And Clarice says, we covet what we see every day. And then they, it dawns on them Buffalo Bill personally knew his first victim, Federica Bimmel. Yeah. That happens after, though, and this a, a moment that I think is the road back, but it's also a re reward for Lecter. <laughs> it's, it's his ultimate boon, but I put it in the road back, so. Same, same, the, yeah. The, the reward for Clarice is the added information provided by Lecter, and now they have figured out a major clue that will help her solve the case. And that is the end of Act Two. Let's go have a drink. Dan, welcome to the Vogler Lounge. <laughs> welcome to the Vogler Lounge, where we have a view, a tree. There's all these moths <laughs> flapping around. It's very strange, but here we are. It puts the drink in the glass. <laughs> oh, Dan. Here we are at the Vogler Lounge, ready to share our themed beverage for Silence of the Lambs. I didn't do a lot of thought on this one. I went for the obvious and... <laughs> you got a bowl of fava beans. I've never been more intimidated than going to the Italian wine section of BevMo. <laughs> I went a couple episodes ago, I don't remember for what, and I just went, oh my God, like it's bigger than every other part of the wine section. But I ended up with a 2015... Chianti Classico from Carobio. It's described on the internet as having intense overtones of red fruits, spices, full-bodied soft tannins, and very well-balanced and dry. So obviously Chianti is what Hannibal Lecter <laughs> drank when he Chianti. ate the, the sensi <laughs> Chianti, a nice Chianti. A census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. That's what I'm going to try. I do not have fava beans, nor do I have human liver, but we'll see. All right, so here we go. It's uh, deep purple. Yep. I cannot be. see through this, even holding it up to the sunlight. Oh, there we go. A little bit of light coming through there. It is deep. Okay, I get um, plum or blackberry, maybe. It doesn't give me that <coughs> when I inhale it deeply. I've got my nose right in there. <laughs> It smells really delicious. It smells sweet. It's making my mouth water. Oh. Never had a Chianti, so here we go. You've never? I've never had a Chianti. I'm not on purpose. Wow. I guess you're not a big wine drinker, so that shouldn't be quite so surprised. Oop, good, good. 
He's doing the chewing thing. Oh, wow. I'm guessing your tongue feels like sandpaper now. It feels like those little snacks they leave you when they when, when you pack something that can't get wet, the little silica desiccant packets. <laughs> I feel like a turtle in that path. Very tannic, mm -hmm. spicy, like pepper, like black pepper. Okay. <coughs> okay, that. <laughs> <What? laughs> Slow down. Yeah, I taste like a, a plum kind of a flavor. Man, it is dry. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Dry. Ah. That's typical for Chianti. It's good. It's good. It's uh good. It's not an easy drinking, but it's uh I yeah. Delicious. I have found that to be the case with Chianti. It's one that maybe I'll have a glass of. I'm thinking about the starchiness of fava beans and the gaminess of liver. I've never had human liver, but I have had chicken liver. And uh, I can see how it would cut through the fattiness and the gaminess of the organ meat. <laughs> I think that was that would be a well-balanced meal. <laughs> we need to do oh, a. Oh no! We need to do a a, a, a movie a vintners fledgling serial killer. Now we need to do a vintner uh, like a, a a wine pairing prefix menu for serial killer movies, and this one would be. Uh, <laughs> liver and fava beans and can yeah. that's an easy one all right what do you got i almost went with the obvious but i didn't i do have a wine but it is not a chianti this is from a winery called the fable list in templeton california that's up near paso robles 2022 pinot noir from the fable list i'm going to show you the label and you will understand why i selected this wine Oh my God, it's a death's head moth. Holy it's the moth. Crap. And it's in the same pose as it's in on the poster. And isn't that incredible? It is the it Michelle is not, saw this. It is not the pupa. It is the actual moth. Yeah. Amazing. Isn't that fantastic? Well, it's pretty. It's brighter. Yes. Yes. Uh, I can see through it if I hold it up to the light, uh, but it's a nice garnet color. I'm having a hard time getting anything on the nose. I've never seen Dan look so flummoxed. That was a bizarre experience there. Really? So I couldn't identify anything on the nose. When I tasted it, <laughs> it was immediately very fruit forward. Okay. Like berries. Hmm. And the finish was stomach bile. Wow. Well, that doesn't sound good. Not, yeah, no. And Is it I'm, rancid? I'm going to, no, it's, it smells fine. I'm going to give it another go. Is it human just, liver just that to, you... Just to make sure that it's not my stomach bile that I was tasting. <laughs> I mean, I didn't... I'm not, like, feeling ill right now or anything. But it was just... It's that huh. sense. It's that 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 taste you get in your mouth if you're... A, right before you're about to vomit. That does not... That taste. That was the finish on this. And I want, I want to give this another... I want to give this another second because... Time to review it on BevMo. Generally, your... I mean, I've been having coffee all morning. Uh, I ate a handful of peanuts about an hour ago in between our first and second acts. So there could have there could be some of that. I also had in my coffee that I was drinking, I've got matcha. So that's a, a completely different kind of flavor that, that might be hmm. messing with this. So I'm giving it some time. Okay. Generally, you have your first taste and then give it 30 seconds, which it about has been this will be a more accurate experience, and I hope it's not stomach bile. It's still there, but it's significantly diminished. It's um, tart acidity hmm. is what it is. It's, it's less stomach bile, <laughs> but tart acidity, I think, is probably a good way to say it. Otherwise, the, the front of it is very berry, blackberry, and, 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 then, and, and then vomit. <laughs> Jeez, man, that's awful. How I will say this though, it's very good. Oh, the finish not so much, but the the wine itself. So as long as I don't stop drinking it and allow the finish to happen, I'll just keep chugging it. So it's all forward, no finish. Then I think I'll be fine. All right, good. So this will be an interesting act three because I'm going to have to drink all of this. All right, well, Dan, as we get deeper into our glasses of berry and bile wine <laughs> before we get into act three we have a special guest
Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Butler is our guest today. He's an award-winning writer, producer, director, and actor with a career spanning four decades. He's probably best known for his portrayal of Bulldog Briscoe on one of the most beloved sitcoms of all time, Frasier. But he's also played all over the country in dozens of professional theater productions from Neil Simon to Shakespeare to Stephen King. He has played roles in such TV shows as House, Star Trek Voyager, The X-Files, and of course, Frasier, which he also directed an episode of, and films including, but not limited to, Enemy of the State, Blonde, and Carl Rove, I Love You, which he also co-wrote, co-directed, and produced. The guy is a monster, but most significantly for us, he played Rodin, the entomologist who identifies the enigmatic Death's Head Moth, in Jonathan Demme's 1991 opus and the subject of this episode, The Silence of the Lambs. Dan Butler, welcome to the Hero's Journey podcast. Thank you so much, Jeff and Dan. Great to have you here. Thank you. Our co-host is also Dan, so (laughs) I'm going to try to call him Dan Zarzana and our guest Dan Butler just Dan, and we'll see how far (laughs) we get with that. So, Dan Butler, this podcast is obviously it's about the hero's journey, but first would love to hear a little bit about what it was like to work on Silence of the Lambs. Oh, my pleasure. It's great going back to those days. Yeah, I remember when I was auditioning for it, uh, Howard Feuer was the casting director and we had a read through of the script and they had me reading like six different roles and I'm going, well, I don't really have a clue for this one, so I'll just go for broke. Um, and, (laughs) and, uh, it was a blast. And so I found out I, I had that part met Paul Lazar, who was the other entomologist. Oh yeah. Wonderful, wonderful actor. And the, the production company was very forthcoming saying, listen, if you want to do research, we'd like to help in any way. And they connected us with the bug wrangler. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> uh, and he was fascinating. I apologize because I'm not remembering his name, but it it was just fascinating being with him. And uh, he was around, like he was under the table giving the little squish when the guts come out of the, the pupa. Um, so he, <laughs> oh yeah. He, and he had the, you can't really hear it on the film, I don't think, but the, the timer beetle that would walk on the chessboard, he would uh-huh. blow it and it would whistle uh, as it took off. And at first, the chessboard was uh, regular chess people. And Paul and I said, "No, we'd be playing with bugs." We, you know, <laughs> oh my oh, god, th- I love that kind of detail. <laughs> we'd so, we, they'd be mounted bugs. <laughs> <laughs> was it your idea to pick up your beetle and and blow on it? No, that uh, oh wait. At I the beginning that? of the scene, you pick it up oh. and you blow on the. Well, he was. He had you been pick doing him up that. and you blow on his underside. Yeah, he was doing. I said, "Well, let's incorporate it." And we met. We were filming it in Pittsburgh, and we were in a museum, and there were entomologists there, and we just made sure: is the script right? Are we saying things we would say? So it was cool being around them. And uh, Jonathan Demi was one of the great human beings on earth. He just. He treated everyone equally, and it was proof that that energy is infectious. It, it was beautiful, everyone. Um, I was around Scott Glenn, uh, you know, when we dr- ride in, but mostly it was uh, mostly it was Paul and and periodically, you know, Jody Foster. It was lovely. There's one moment in your performance that sticks with me every time I watch. I'm sure I've watched this movie a dozen times or more. Uh, You have the tag in that scene where you say you're looking down at the moth and you say uh, somebody loved him. And You have this. (laughs) What what, I just want to know from do you remember like in actor mode what what your choice was in that moment? What was the moth to you? You know, I just, uh, you know, you find your way into the skin of whoever you're playing and then sort of let go and hope whatever comes at the right time. (laughs) Um, (laughs) What I do remember is those originally weren't my lines. Uh, The early part of the scenes, you know, Paul was all about, uh, I mean, he was a scientist, but he was also hitting on Jody um, through the scene. Right. And, uh, they just said, it doesn't make sense for Paul to be saying some of these lines. You seem to clearly have 
an emotional connection to this specific insect. But uh, so let's move let's move these lines. It's a two and a half minute sequence, but obviously it's incredibly critical to the story. How do you find your place in the story and how does it impact your performance when you know you you're delivering this this important chunk? Well, I must be honest, that doesn't that didn't go across my mind. It's just the the I know what I loved was that it's probably the only levity <laughs> in the entire film where, you know, you sort of ah, you know, for a moment. Uh, and maybe that's why that information is allowed to come in, because it's, you know, you've got, oh, thank God, these people are weirdos and and I love them. And <laughs> and what is this world we're in? And even she's, you know, even Jodie Foster yeah. smiling. Um, so I yeah, think it's for some of the only moments in the movie. Yeah, it's sort of an oasis. And I think, you know, to just couple with what you were saying, I think that Ah, that sort of exhale sigh. You're going. You're taking in new information. It's a spoonful of sugar coming in. It's great hearing the two of you talk about this from the perspective of actors. I'm not an actor, so I don't know any mm. of the the process that you two are talking about. So it's interesting to hear it from from my chair. Yeah, I mean, with acting, you try as much as you can to start at a blank slate, so you're not pulling the thing you did last into this, and just know that the penny's going to drop. I mean, for me, this works more on stage, but the, you know, the, through rehearsal, the penny's going to drop, the understanding's, understanding's coming through. Now, in the, in, uh, uh, the way Jeff and I uh, learned through a class we took together, uh, you're just processing every, sh you know, every shot, you're just processing while the camera's rolling. And maybe trying, you know, that's your, every shot is a rehearsal. So you're just trying to give the editor different choices and you're figuring it out instead of, I figured this all out and I'm going to remount it. Um, and maybe that works for other people. I mean, I'm sure, but I just, I have a fond uh, place in my memory for, for the, for working on this and having fun with it. Okay. So when you and I were messaging beforehand, Dan Butler, you had mentioned that, me bringing up the hero's journey had some synchronicity because you were just talking to somebody about that Bill Moyers, Joseph Campbell special. Do you want to share what that connection was about recently? I just remember when I first listened to it, I was flying over to London from Los Angeles and I had sort of heard you know, the phrase, follow your bliss, but I did not associate it with anyone. So to just one little nugget of realizing, oh, it came from him. And, you know, I listened to all six episodes nonstop on the way over and my, um, my jaw dropped. It was exactly what I needed to hear at that mm -hmm. moment and was a really good um, opening to a completely new journey for me. Do you remember when that was, that call to adventure of listening to the Bill Moyers, Joseph Campbell interview? Oh, it was 1992. Oh. Oh, wow. So really shortly before you and I met and right before Frasier. Yeah, it definitely felt like the crack open had been, uh, I think, a breakup of a relationship that had been a rebound relationship. So I was finally cracking into the morning of about eight years. Mm. At the same time, this great joy was like... <laughs> fusing in and the Joseph Campbell stuff seemed to bring all of those energies together. So since, since you heard those specials and had that cracking open, has it affected your work at all when you're like when you're approaching script analysis or when you're trying to find your way into a role? What, what's that experience like? It's definitely in there. It, it, you know, when I first took it in, I, I, it's one of those things. It's almost like, um, you know, poetry serves a very powerful um, purpose in my life. And I feel led to certain poems that give me a spine, some sort of spiritual spine. Hmm. And so I put the Joseph Campbell message sort of in, in that same in that same category. You know, it's a kind of prayer, really. You know, whatever higher power you're talking to is just to have the courage to be your best self in this journey. Yeah. Some power's higher vision of you 
that many times we dismiss. Ah, Dan, thank you so much for joining us for this interview. It has been it exceeded my expectation and definitely a highlight in the six years we've been doing this podcast. Yes, certainly. Thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. A reminder, the full 30-minute interview is available at the Hero's Journey podcast Patreon page. For all Patreon subscribers, ally tier and above, we hope you enjoy it, and we look forward to the opportunity to record more interviews. Act 3 begins with the road back. The hero is pursued by vengeful forces, disturbed when they seize the object of their quest. Lecter's escape. Oh boy. Lecter has been imprisoned for eight years, mostly in the same room. He has finally managed to get himself into a lower security situation, and boy does he take advantage of it. In an incredibly scary and gruesome sequence, Lecter escapes his cell in the courthouse. So the cops on duty bring him a second dinner, lamb chops extra rare just for the poetry of it. Behind his privacy screen, he regurgitates the clip from Chilton's pen, raising the question, how was he able to get the pen if he was bound up? Yes. We don't know. Lecter's a genius, and we just assume that somehow he got a hold of the pen <laughs> and got the clip into his mouth, <laughs> was able to swallow it, keep it in some kind of part of his throat, and regurgitate it. I have heard of people being able to do that. I have on occasion swallowed a pill that didn't go down all the way, uh -huh. had other things to eat and drink, and then later had to like barf the pill back up to swallow it. So I think it's possible. <laughs> I think that's how they got the taste of your wine. That's the part of the movie that almost breaks it for me. And I'm wondering if it's intentionally left ambiguous or mysterious so that we can wonder, what did he do? How did he manage to get a pen when everybody's been so careful with him so far? How did this happen? Well, we did, you know, they definitely show us Chilton playing with the pen. They show him, you know, we show, they show the pen being left on his bunk. So I think what they were trying to do is say, this guy is such a genius. He's so resourceful. He's been able to manipulate everyone. But somehow he's, because of this one screw up of Chilton's, he's been able to take advantage of it. But we're not sure how. And Chilton is being so arrogant when what he perceives as his control of Hannibal Lecter, yeah. that he's gotten complacent and made this mistake. Mistake. Yeah. So as soon as Lieutenant Boyle, played so well by character actor Charles Napier, as soon as Boyle cuffs him to the bars of the cell so they can serve his dinner, he picks the cuffs with the pen clip, frees himself, and then cuffs Boyle to the bars in his place. And then he attacks the other cop, Sergeant Pembry, chewing off part of his face and then <laughs> smashes his head against the bars and then sprays him right in the eyes with his own mace. Yeah. And then throws him out of the cell so he can turn to Boyle and in a terrifying shot, beats him to death with Pembry's billy club. His face is covered with blood. There's blood splattered all across his white T-shirt and he is just very intentionally breathing and striking and just with medical precision, he is murdering this cop. And with great satisfaction. Oh, he's enjoying it. Blood splashes also over his uneaten second dinner, probably <laughs> making it more appetizing to Hannibal, but he doesn't have time for a snack. <laughs> and then in terrifying quietude, he listens to some classical music on his tape deck, and then he spots Boyle's pocket knife and opens it, exiting the cell, and says, ready when you are, Sergeant Pembry. <laughs> <laughs> Cut downstairs to the cops. They watch as the elevator ascends to the fifth floor. They hear gunshots, and they can't raise any of the guards on the radio. So they dispatch some cops to investigate. The elevator comes down again, but it's empty. The cops that they sent upstairs burst into the ballroom where Lecter is being kept, and they find Lieutenant Boyle crucified on the cage he's hanging there and there's this light shining from behind him but Pembry appears to be lying on the ground and still alive and so they they get Pembry and they rush him to an ambulance where he sits up and peels off his face and it's Hannibal Lecter he has escaped <laughs> it's such a tense gruesome sequence that I want to play shot by shot but that's the that's the gist of it yeah Clarice's roommate, Ardelia, gets a call and informs Clarice that Lecter has escaped. 
and Clarice is distraught. She didn't get the name out of him. Catherine Martin is as good as dead. But inspired by Lecter's claims that everything she needs is in the case file, this is where the detail is revealed. She opens, she sees the map. This is where that reward comes into play. She connects the map and the the markings of where the bodies were found with Hannibal's clue that he gives her during the ordeal that, What does Buffalo Bill do? He covets. And how do we begin to covet? We covet what we see every day. And she goes, light bulb moment. He knew Buffalo Bill knew the first victim. So the investigation continues. And now Clarice is a vengeful force. She is tracking Buffalo Bill down with this new information she gained from coughing up her darkest memories to Hannibal Lecter. So she visits the first victim's home, Frederica Bimmel, and find some risque Polaroids in a music box. And then she spots an unfinished dress hanging in her closet. And it has the same diamond shaped cuts on it as the skin of the victim that she autopsied. And she has a light bulb moment. She calls Crawford. He's making himself a woman's suit, Mr. Crawford, out of real women. And he, and he can sew this guy. He's, he's very skilled. He's a tailor or a dressmaker. Or, that's why they're all so big. He has to keep them alive so he can starve them a while so that he can loosen their Starling. skin and take... Starling, Starling, we know who he is and where he is. We're on our way right now. Where? Calumet City, edge of Chicago. We'll be on the ground in 45 minutes with HRT. They've already ID'd Bill based on the records from John Hopkins, the sex reassignment rejections, and on an exotic shipment of caterpillars. But we see the guy's photo, and it's not Buffalo Bill. We've seen Buffalo Bill, and the guy that they've ID'd is not him. Oh, I thought that that was just that Buffalo Bill is kind of a chameleon. Hmm. So I thought maybe that was him. That was just an old image of him. That must be it, because that solves another problem I had, which was I thought that photo wasn't him and that that ID'd the wrong guy in which case the exotic caterpillar shipment would have made no sense. But if that is a photo of him, then that solves that problem for me. So thank you for clarifying that. A jame gum, that's the most awkward name to say, and they all have to overpronounce it for that reason. (laughs) So Crawford tells Clarice, don't don't come here. You won't get here in time. Go to stay in Ohio and connect Bill to the first victim. Clarice is almost disappointed. She's disappointed that she didn't get to catch him. She's exhilarated by finding this clue. So now she's let her guard down. Yeah, she's got to do busy work now while they get the glory of breaking the man's door down and catching him. Right. Cut to Buffalo Bill's Moth Emporium and Catherine Martin becomes a (laughs) vengeful force. Back at Billy's place, Bill is putting on makeup and dancing in front of a video camera and tucking his junk between his legs. Dan, would you F him? Because he would F him. He'd F him so hard. I will never see Monk the same way again. Totally changes the meaning of bang, bang, bang side now, doesn't it? (laughs) Chuck to the back. Good. (laughs) Clarice locates a childhood friend of Catherine's who gives her the address of the woman Catherine used to work for, a seamstress named Mrs. Lippman, and she heads to the house. Back at Billy's, Catherine Martin becomes a vengeful force because using the the lotion bucket and a bone from some meal that he's provided her, uh, she lures Precious and gets her down into the pit. And now she says to Bill, "Get me a, if you don't get me a phone, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your dog, mister. Dude, you leave Precious alone. <laughs> you don't know what pain is. It's such a great scene. So the FBI is closing in on the house. Cut to inside. Buffalo Bill is losing his cool. He pulls a massive revolver out from underneath his swastika quilt. I mean, this, this is, is a hand cannon. It's a hand cannon. And then the doorbell rings. The next segment of the hero's journey is a resurrection. The hero faces death one more time in a final battle or showdown. So we're seeing this alert system that Buffalo Bill has in his dungeon basement. And it is ringing as the FBI man on the surface is ringing the doorbell of the house that they have surrounded. Crawford gives the order to bust into the house. At the same time, Buffalo Bill is putting on his pants and a shirt, and he opens the front door of his house, and there is Clarice Starling. Good afternoon. Um, Sorry to bother you. I'm looking for Mrs. Lippman's family. Oops. The FBI have just broken into the wrong house. 
Clarice is now interviewing the man who identifies himself as Jack Gordon. Notice that all of his names are JG names. So she's asking about Mrs. Lipman. I'm looking for Mrs. Lipman. He says, oh, the Lipmans don't live here anymore. I bought the house a couple of years ago, but I think I've got her son's business card here in the house. So why don't you come in and I'll, and I'll go find it for you. And so while he's looking through this series of business cards, she's looking around at this house. He says he moved in two years ago. Uh huh. The stuff in this house oh boy. looks like it's been there for a very long time. Then Clarice sees a death's head moth fluttering around these spools of thread. And she knows that this is not Jack Gordon in front of her. This is Jamie Gum. I have a question for you. Did you ever think that maybe he is Mrs. Lippman's son? That Buffalo Bill is Mrs. Lippman's son? And that's how he knew Federica Bimmel? And that's why the house looks so lived in? I had not thought of that at all, but that certainly does make a lot of sense. I thought of that for the for the reason you just brought up, because he can't have moved in there two years ago. It, 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 there's just no way that's only two years worth of living in a place. Yeah. My assumption was that he had maybe killed Mrs. Lippman and just taken over her house. But it makes sense then that he is Mrs. Lippman's son, because otherwise, wouldn't the neighbors be concerned? Like, where did Mrs. Lippman go? Well, yeah. but... If she had passed away and her son is still living in the house, that also explains how he's been able to build this dungeon in the basement right. and all that without anybody knowing or being suspicious. That's a really good... I wonder if it's in the book. I wonder what his real name is. Yeah. Oh, was she, was she a great big fat person? <laughs> she was a big girl, yes. <laughs> Clarice now unsnaps... The strap on her holster prepares to draw down on him, and she says, can I use your phone? And <laughs> I love this performance by Ted Levine as he's, he starts giggling. Yeah. Holding these business cards. Sure, you can use my phone. And then she draws down on him, and he runs into the kitchen and vanishes. Another whole scene that would have been ruined by the existence of cell phones. Jack would have called Clarice. She wouldn't have knocked on the door or he would have opened the door and he would have said, oh, yeah, I have that guy's contact info in my phone. Here it is. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> yeah, why I'm obsessed with this, a... but every movie I watch that's pre late 90s, it's amazing how much of the movie would have to change just because of the existence of cell phones. That's one of those technologies that just changed everything in a profound way that is we take for granted now. Now we have Clarice, though visibly terrified. Oh, so scared. Pursues Buffalo Bill into his dungeon and is greeted by the horrors of what the man has been doing. We see a seamstress mannequin. I, I, I don't know if that's what that's called, but it's... Uh, I think it's called a dress form, but I could be dress wrong. Dress form? Okay. With half of a female skin suit on it. And she sees more of the moths, and she makes contact with Catherine Martin in the pit. Still hasn't found Buffalo Bill yet, but she's making her way through this dungeon and seeing all of this stuff. And then the lights go out. Pitch black. And then we see her, for the first time, through Buffalo Bill's eyes as he's got the night vision goggles on. And so we're seeing... His perspective, his view on her as she right. stumbles around in the dark, waving her gun around. Her gun hand is trembling. She. This is a great performance, I thought, by Jodie Foster. Yes. She is absolutely terrified. Oh, it's, it's uh, yeah. What an exhausting scene that must have been to shoot, to be constantly just scared. <laughs> yeah. To, oh, yeah, yeah. She's, oh. And we see Bill reach out to touch her, almost to like caress her face. Oof. And his fingers are just centimeters away. And then he pulls his hand back. And then we see him raise his revolver and cock the hammer. That sound, Clarice hears it, spins around, empties her revolver into the darkness. But we hear seven shots. Exactly the number of times... That Brad Pitt fired at the end. No? <laughs> I love you so much, Dan. 
So we know that Bill got off a round before Clarice pumped him full of hollow points. Watching that all happen lit only by the light of the muzzle flash is incredible, like a strobe effect almost. Yeah, it very much is. Fortunately, one of her rounds hits a blacked out window and breaks it open. So now we've got some daylight. God, so good. As she watches Buffalo Bill, a.k.a. Jane Gum, a.k.a. Jack Gordon, spit up blood and he dies. And that was the end of the resurrection. That brings us to return with the elixir or freedom to live. The hero, having won a precious treasure or reward, now returns to the ordinary world to share the spoils of battle. Catherine Martin is rescued and brought out of the house, clutching precious to her chest as they take her to an ambulance. I don't know that I would want precious in my house. What was Bill feeding precious? Like, that's just... (laughs) mm. I think Bill loved precious so much that... Precious probably got only the best dog food from the market at the store. I I think you probably fed them the women. (laughs) Back in Quantico, Crawford looks on as Clarice Starling graduates from the academy and then cut to the cake with the FBI seal on it. And the woman cutting the cake cuts a two and a half pound slice of this (laughs) cake. The size of the slice of that cake is like, that's got to be 2,200 calories. And she just used both hands to lift the plate and hand. It's, it's the ma- watch that. I must have watched, replayed that scene like three times ago. The size of the, and the thing I is. I thought it was a super close up shot of the cake, but it really is just it's a, a huge, medium shot of a massive cake. Well, and the other thing about it is I can't, like when I cut a cake, I don't cut the cake because I'm never, like I can never get a, a straight wedge, like an accurate wedge. I'm always slightly off center and it drives me absolutely insane. <laughs> so she cuts a perfect slice. And I don't know how many times they did that shot, but they would have had to have a fresh cake for every shot because she cuts the f- first slice. I think she's she's a one take. They got a professional cake cutter. Our son, when he turned 12, his request was that he could cut the cake any way he wanted. And we said, sure, it's your cake. And he cut an off-center triangle out of the middle of the cake, which is when I first knew that he was a sociopath. Just, I still, it still bothers me. I can't look at a Uh cake. Anyway, Uh he's a good boy. Anyway, and then she's interrupted yet again in the middle of something important. She's graduated, trying to celebrate. No, she's got a phone call. Yep. Leave Clarice They're trying to do a selfie with Roden. Yeah. Wait, Roden was in the scene? That was him and Dr. Pilcher. Oh, my God. When they're trying to, t- trying to take a selfie, they're trying to take a picture. Oh, my God. How did I not? I've seen it. What? Stopping the podcast to go watch that scene again. Wow. Okay. That's amazing. How did I not? Wow. I do wonder why they were there. Not celebrating. Well, because Pilcher's still trying to get. Oh, that's right. Pilcher's. Are you hitting on me, Doc? Yes. I think in the backstory, Roden is the one who gets that number because Clarice is impressed by intelligence and detail, not by charm. (laughs) And he knew the Latin name of that moth without having to look it up. Yeah. Anyway, the phone call is from Hannibal Lecter. Starling. Wow, Clarice. Have the lamb stopped screaming? Dr. Lecter. And we cut to him, and he's far away, maybe in the Caribbean I think, because there's like banana trees. Right. and I wondered if it was Jamaica or Bermuda. Yeah. Or... So he's in disguise and he tells Clarice. Yes, I know. Bermuda's not in the Caribbean. I'm just saying. Yeah, Isn't it weird? Bermuda's off the coast. Of... Yeah, it's very strange. Anyway. Yeah, it's off the coast of Carolinas. Way off the coast, but still. So he tells Clarice that he has no plans to call on her. The world is a more interesting place with her in it. Yeah. Isn't that sweet? Oh, thanks, Which is Dad. sweet, but it's also like, if you're not interesting enough, I would eat you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So at least he, these are my boundaries, he's telling her. So then he spots Chilton getting off a small plane, very nervous. And he says to Clarice that he regrets he can't talk longer. He's having an old friend for dinner. <laughs> and he hangs up, leaving Clarice in the FBI headquarters saying, Dr. Lecter, Dr. Lecter, as he walks off following Chilton. Clarice has caught the bad guy, and we know that Lecter's not coming after her, and that is her freedom to live. That's correct. And Lecter is free to pursue his dinner plans, Dr. Chilton. That's correct. (laughs) 
I remember you and I being in the theater to watch something. I don't know what we were there to see, but this would have been mid to late 90s. And a trailer for Contact starring Jodie Foster came up. And the trailer was just a slow push in of Jodie Foster sitting on the hood of the car with the headphones on listening for the signals. And then it's dead silent in the theater. And then you, little performer Jeff, <laughs> says, Dr. Richter, is that you? And the theater lost its shit. <laughs> Everyone laughed and I was like, oh my God. Don't encourage him, everybody. Don't I, encourage him. I remember that, but I don't remember the whole theater laughing. I just remember you being embarrassed. Yeah, I probably would. I still am. You don't remember the theater laughing? Maybe that's no. just how I've corrected the memory in my head so that it's acceptable. I think we've established that your memory is better than mine. It was so well-timed, too. <laughs> Dr. Lecter, is that you? <laughs> if I have one thing, it's good timing. Listeners and patrons, thank you so much for joining us for this episode. If you're enjoying this podcast, please call one of your friends, text them, rave about it, get them to listen. Word of mouth is still the most powerful way you can support this podcast and keep it going. Like and subscribe, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And hey, if you are a Google Podcasts listener, be aware that Google is discontinuing that service as of April 1st. But worry not. Open your Google Podcast app. At the top, you will see a little link to easily transfer your subscriptions to YouTube Music. Tap the Export to YouTube Music option at the top of the app. I did it myself. It took a matter of seconds. And now I can listen to all of my Google Podcasts on YouTube Music. If you would like to support the podcast, please visit patreon.com slash Heroes Journey Podcast and see if one of the available tiers appeals to you thanks to you all of the patrons who make this show possible including our demigod patrons who we enjoy naming in every episode john peterson jr scott sanford ricky garvin jeff scott joseph wilbur michelle calderon ami garvin salathiel jones jasmine and pete hudson mike and Susie zarzana and randy sparks Special thanks to Taylor Jordan for composing our theme music. Thank you to Jason Dorf for the episode artwork. Links to their portfolios can be found on the About page of HeroesJourneyPodcast.com. Also, follow us on Instagram. Jeff posts Jason's artwork for every episode on our Instagram page. So that's, that's a great place for you to go to see Jason's work. The trademark Heroes Journey is under license from the Joseph Campbell Foundation. Visit www.jcf.org to learn about how the foundation promotes and celebrates the work of Joseph Campbell. Silence of the Lambs is copyright night. <laughs> That's so good. That is a really good... <laughs> is copyright... A Bill impression. 1990 Orion Pictures Corporation. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, journey on. Caterpillar into chrysalis, or pupa, and from thence into beauty. <laughs>